Next, we want to look at the appeals in more detail. Now, when we consider how a text is effective, we can focus on these three appeals, but we can also consider other things, the genre, what form it's written in, how it's organized, the specific style or use of narrative, as well as other rhetorical devices. When we consider ethos, pathos, and logos, we consider how persuasive writing is effective. Notice at the top, Susan Smith tells us that according to Aristotle, rhetoric is the art of discovering the means of persuasion. Rhetoric comes into play when there is some debate about an outcome. The person who is seeking to convince the rhetor chooses the means to persuade the audience that the conclusion is a valid one. Rhetor rhetorical analysis identifies, excuse me, identifies how writing achieves praise or blame, attack or defense, judgment of the past, or recommendation for future action. Notice that strategies may serve more than one appeal. Notice that Smith has classified the str strategies under each of the appeals, but then notice that there are also more strategies that you can consider style, words, tone, appearance, and what is not on the page. When we think in terms of the text, the arguments that we have already read, you could see that they use these elements in addition to ethos, pathos, and logos. But let's look at each one of the appeals closely and see what we look for in a text. First of all, logic or reason as an appeal goes to common sense. We use examples to support. In the Writing Today text, they identify these specific types of reasoning that can be categorized as logical appeals. And then when we look at the Hacker and Summers text, we can see that they, that they address what reasonable arguments look like and whether or not arguments are reasonable or fallacious, logical fallacies. And by evaluating our argument, we determine if the argument is reasonable and therefore if the logic is not only effective but valid. Notice at the bottom of the page, we're on page 147 in writing today, that they tell us that the word logos means reasoning and that the word is the basic for the English word logic. And then continuing on 148, the writers remind us that logic in, that reasoning involves more than using logic to prove a point. It also involves appealing to common sense by using examples to demonstrate a point. Then they list for us some specific ways that we use reasoning to influence beliefs. If you believe one thing, then you should also believe another. We are going to look at a speech, and I want you to pay attention to how the speaker suggests that if we believe one thing, we should believe a second thing that we are given a choice, that we use reasoning to show that one thing happens because of another, that we address the cost and the benefits, that we consider if one option is better or worse than another and the reasons for that, that we give examples to demonstrate, that we provide facts and data to support our argument, and finally, we tell stories that demonstrate that something is true. If we look at the hacker text and look at the section on academic writing, we look at the section A2, Constructing Reasonable Arguments, and look at the subheadings, subheadings here. Examining context, we'll discuss momentarily. Establishing credibility, which will go to ethos. Supporting claims with evidence and countering opposing arguments, building common ground. 
these are all ways that you construct a reasonable argument. I want us to look at a couple of these. The first one we're going to look at is context, examining an issue's context. You remember earlier we defined historical context, and this is what the Hacker and Summers text is addressing here, the fact that arguments do not occur in a vacuum. There are individuals and groups that are interested. There are individuals and groups that will be affected both positively and negatively by actions and behaviors. So we take those into account when we are examining an when we are examining a text to determine if it is persuasive. Do they take into account the social and intellectual context in which the argument occurs? The second thing I wanted you to look at is about persuasive lines of argument. Notice that there is a thesis and then there are supporting claims for that thesis. How we organize our ideas is another way we use logic. Notice that Hacker and Summers say if you, su if you sum up your main lines of argument, you have a rough outline of your essay. And then you provide evidence for each of the claims. So organizationally, we have a thesis that states our position, and then we have supporting claims. The thesis can be considered the central claim, and then we have supporting claims that provide background and evidence to support the position being taken. The same thing will be true with a rhetorical analysis. We take a position, and then we find examples from the text that show how effectively a writer uses ethos or pathos or logos. And finally, I wanted you to look at supporting claims with evidence. Again, we're looking at logos. How does a writer appeal to reason? We use specific evidence. We're going to scroll through this. We use facts and statistics. We use examples and illustrations. We may use pictures. We can cite expert author opinion or authorities, which also can go to credibility, that other authority. And we anticipate and counter opposing arguments. This is one of the things that's particularly important. Good argument doesn't just present one side. It presents both sides and then lets the reader make an informed decision. In section A3, the Hacker and Summers text asks us to evaluate arguments. Notice that the first section is distinguishing between reasonable and fallacious tactics. Remember, we discussed logical fallacies. And then it talks about distinguishing between legitimate and unfair emotional appeals. Those are not fallacious tactics, but they may be unfair. So let's look briefly at those. Inductive reasoning or generalizing is legitimate, but if we do it with too little evidence, generalize with too little evidence, that is a logical fallacy. Stereotypes are a kind of generalizing that is based on hasty generalization. When we come to conclusions using deductive reasoning, we need to make sure that all of our premises are true, otherwise our conclusion will not be true. When we think in terms of presenting arguments, we think in terms of both presenting arguments reasonably and legitimately, and when we are analyzing arguments, we need to think in terms of whether or not the writer is using logic reasonably and rationally. And if we go back to the essay website, we can see the list of logical fallacies, those things that look like they may be good logic but aren't. And on the same page, you'll find that there are additional sources of information for discussion and examples. Uh, the literacy education online groups fallacies by type of appeal. But these are excellent resources if you want to look further into false logic.
When we appeal to emotion, that is legitimate, and it is a legitimate argumentative tactic, but remember that we should not misuse emotional appeals. We need to make sure that we're not using words with connotations that are not legitimate to our argument. We need to make sure that we're not attacking the person instead of addressing an idea. We need to make sure that we're not distracting the reader. So there are legitimate ways to appeal to emotion that fall into reasonable argument, and then there are ways that are not legitimate. So be aware of them, both in what you read and in the way you write. And finally, is an argument legitimate and rational? Does it present the opposition's views fairly and accurately? Good logic indicates that it does. Make sure that when you present opposition in your writing, you do it fairly. And it, when you read, look to see if what you're reading presents arguments from the other side fairly and reasonably and objectively. The next appeal is ethos, credibility, our own or that of an authority. It's sometimes referred to as character and ethics. Your textbook talks about a variety of ethical appeals or appeals to credibility that are legitimate, and Hacker and Summers addresses those as well, some we have already looked at. Let's look at the Writing Today text. First of all, the definition of ethos, credibility, authority, or character. It is also the basis for the English word ethics. So it is the author's credibility or someone else's credibility. When you are looking at your text, look and see when and where an author uses appeals to credibility. The same thing is true with ethos. Look and see when and where your author appeals to logic, those elements of rational, reasonable argument that the Hacker and Summers text identify. Notice the kinds of examples that writing today uses. Personal experience, personal credentials. Make sure if you're using exper personal experience that your experience is representative of the whole and not unique to you. You can use good moral character. You can appeal to experts. You can identify with your readers. You can admit your limitations. You certainly want your reader to know that you value them and their opinions, and you can use language that your audience is going to readily understand. Hacker and Summers reminds us that we can establish our credibility by being knowledgeable, by showing the reader that you are knowledgeable and fair-minded. You can do this through information, and you can also do it by uh, the language that you choose. In this section that we've already looked at, notice citing expert opinion. This also is one way you establish credibility. Make sure you're using experts that are experts in the field that uh, you're discussing and explain why they are experts when you introduce them. Look for that when you read. When we anticipate objections and we address them fairly and reasonably, we are establishing our credibility. We have already looked at judging how fairly the writer handles opposing views, but again, this is one way that you establish your credibility, knowing that you, showing that you are knowledgeable and showing that you understand the opposition and are willing to address it rationally and calmly. The last appeal is to pathos. Uh, we appeal through promises of gain, promises of enjoyment, fear of loss, fear of pain, expressions of anger and disgust. Notice that we evoke emotions. It's better to evoke positive emotions. We need to evoke the negative ones as little as possible, but we do that to make a point. Notice again the idea that we're looking for the use of these appeals in what we read, and we also notice how we use these appeals when we write. 
the hacker and, te and Summers text addresses building common ground and establishing credibility in order to appeal to emotion. My apologies. Are emotional appeals legitimate? Let's look at the text and see what they tell us. Our text tells us that there are eight basic emotions. Look for places where those emotions are used to persuade. Obviously, advertising addresses emotions. And notice that there are other emotions that may be addressed as well. Finally, they mention the fact that writers do not state emotions directly. Instead, they incorporate images, uh, and they also may use music or other means to convey emotion. One of the ways that we appeal to emotion is through common ground. That is, that we acknowledge uh, the other, that the audience emotional investment in something and we show how we share that. And you remember again that the Hacker and Summers text addresses the distinction between legitimate and unfair emotional appeals. Pay attention to those both as you read and as you write. And going back to Sue Smith's handout, The Art of Rhetoric, Look at the appeals, ethical appeals, credibility, character, confidence, emotional appeals, where we inspire feeling, our awareness of the opposition, our awareness of the audience's cultural and emotional background and finding common ground there, our awareness of the audience concerns, and then always logic is the starting point. What kind of evidence is provided? How is the paper organized? Can you follow the train of thought easily? Is the information relevant to the case? Again, that idea of you don't want um, something unique. You want to make sure that the examples and illustrations you use are representative. And what is the relationship to other arguments of like kind? Remember as well that the writer or speaker may be appealing through other ways, through style, words, tone, appearance, and omission. Notice that when you analyze a text, your rhetorical analysis, you should address the three appeals as central to the text ability to persuade. However, you may also address other appeals as well. When we are writing rhetorical analysis, we consider logos, ethos, and pathos as the primary appeals that a writer uses in order to convince the audience of the position or the proposal. Consider those as you read.